What I do hopefully bring to you today is something that will help you change. And you might need to pray about this because when we are interacting with people who live with dementia, they cannot change. And we must change ourselves to make our interactions and our communications work. So I am delighted to be here today. Thank you very much for the invitation. When um, you leave today, I will have some brochures on the table outside. I'll refer to them as we go throughout the talk today. And what I'm gonna do is go through the talk and then I was given a list of questions to try to answer. When I looked at the list, my stomach sank because they are the questions that I get asked often and they are almost impossible to answer because everybody's circumstance is different. Everybody is unique, but I will do the best I can for you. And I will stay, I can't stay for lunch, I'm so sorry. I need to be in a different city very quickly after the talk today. But I will stay for a few minutes if, if you have questions for sure. So let's get right into it. I, I don't want to put people to sleep with statistics and numbers, but I want to draw your attention to two things on this slide. And when we're talking about numbers of people living with dementia, those are pretty big numbers when you read them. But I want you to keep in mind, those are the number of people with the diagnosis. When we are talking about any, any type of dementia, we are talking about a ripple effect because it is not just the person who has received the diagnosis, but it is every other person in that person's circle, their family, their friends, their neighbors, and sometimes their co-workers, their grandchildren, their church brethren. It is everybody who interacts with that person that is affected. So these numbers really are only the tip of the iceberg. The other thing that I wanna draw your attention to is this number here about people under the age of 65. When somebody develops dementia, and there are several types of dementia that you can develop under the age of 65, they call it young onset. Young onset dementia, and that is a world unto itself. It's very complicated because you often still have children at home, and you are often still in the workforce, and often the services are designed for people over the age of 65. So I just wanted to draw your attention to the fact that it is not just seniors who develop dementia. So when we're talking about it, I better define the word to make sure that we're all on the same page. When I say the word dementia, I'm talking about an umbrella term Dementia is a collection of symptoms. It's, it's a syndrome. You would have some sort of organic brain disease that starts to affect your brain, and eventually, when your brain could not self-repair and self-regulate, it would become overwhelmed, and you would not function the way you used to function. You would notice changes in memory, language, um, ability to do daily tasks, judgment, reasoning, personality, behavior, and these changes would increase over time. And you'd probably go to the doctor to get checked, and then the word dementia would come out. There are many, many different types of dementia, and I'm going to take you through some of the really common types of dementia. But dementia is not a disease in and of itself. Dementia is the symptoms that accompany a wide variety of different diseases. But if you can bear in mind, there's always an organic change occurring in the brain that's driving these cognition and behavior changes. So, most commonly Alzheimer's. Probably everybody has heard the term Alzheimer's dementia. It is one type. It is the most common type of dementia. It tends to start with um, memory loss, but it is much, much more than memory loss alone. If you have memory loss, you might have a problem, but you don't necessarily have Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer's is, is much more complicated. 
More women than men get Alzheimer's. In fact, the statistics say approximately 72% of the cases of Alzheimer's are females. Sorry, I don't know why. It's a little scary. I'm a female standing here talking about it. I'm as scared as you are in the audience. Um, they're looking at everything from the physical. Does it have to do with changes in hormones after menopause? To the psychological? Does it have to do with a lifetime of caregiving? They don't have a definitive answer, but it, it does occur. Then there's a whole series of dementias that are called frontal temporal, frontal temporal dementias. They obviously start in the front and temporal sides of the brain. They don't start with memory loss. Oh, and that confuses people because they assume memory loss equals dementia. Not so. When you have any, we call them FTD for short. When you have any of the FTDs, you probably have an intact memory, but you're going to notice either changes in language or judgment, behavior, and reasoning. Then there's something called Lewy body. Now, some of you might have heard anybody, heard, I got one finger, three, four, five, it's a handful. Yeah, and in the back, I see that finger in the back. When we're talking about Lewy body dementia, we're talking about something that tends to affect more men than women. Now it's the men's turn. And with Lewy body, it looks like a cross between Parkinson's and Alzheimer's disease. There's Parkinsonian symptoms, so there's slowness, rigidity, shuffling, falls, uh, sometimes tremor, and there's fluctuations in cognition. The hallmark feature of Lewy body dementia is vivid visual hallucinations. So all of the different dementias have their own personality, if you will. They all look a little different to start with. But as they progress, they become more and more the same. So the information I'm going to give you today is legit for, for any type of dementia you're working with. Vascular dementia, second most common type that there is. It can come from a major stroke or it can come from a series of small strokes, TIAs, transient ischemic attacks, sort of a cumulative effect of white matter disease or vessel disease. Unfortunately, you can have more than one type at once. I'm a real upper, aren't I? <laughs> but you have to know the truth of the matter. And this is what makes it so complicated. You can have Alzheimer's and vascular at the same time. You can have Lewy body and Alzheimer's at the same time. It makes it very, very difficult to diagnose. And then I mentioned the young onset earlier. Anytime it's under the age of 65, they call it young onset. The two most common types of young onset dementia are Alzheimer's disease and frontotemporal. So we, I do have a picture. It's not a hat, but I got a picture. And when you look at this photo, well, it's a collection of photos. When you look at all those faces, tell me, who on that page has dementia? Which person is living with dementia right now? So we have some guesses that it's the happiest. We have a guess that it's the lady at the bottom. I'm assuming that's the lady you're referring to, lady at the bottom. You don't know. And I don't know. And here's the tricky part. And this is worth paying attention to because we as human beings don't even know we're doing this, but we are. We look at people and we just instantly make an assumption based on how they present what we can expect from that person. It's just the way we work as humans. And so what happens is when people live with dementia, until they get into the very later stages of the journey, they look fabulous on the outside. And so you take one look at them and you think, oh, I have an expectation about how you're going to behave and how our interaction is going to go. And your expectation may be here, and their level of ability may actually be here, even though they look great on the outside. So it's very much an invisible disability. 
I have dear and close family members living with dementia. I take pictures of my family members. They could be put on Vogue magazine. These two people look tremendous. They look beautiful. We take great care of these people. And let me tell you, they cannot function for five minutes without somebody beside them. But you cannot tell by looking, so don't get fooled. Also, don't assume every single person you talk to has to <laughs> So what I want to do is I want to take you inside. I want to show you some pictures inside the brain. Because this is what you can't see, but this is what you need to know. So I got a picture. This is under an electron microscope. This is an actual picture of what we call a beta amyloid plaque. Don't worry about the name. These beta amyloids, we all have beta amyloid in our brain. It's a protein. We get into trouble when the beta amyloid misprocesses and little tiny filaments get cut off and, and they start floating around in your brain. These filaments are sticky and they're toxic. And so because they're sticky, when they bump into each other, they start to clump together. And because they're toxic, they cause inflammation. They eventually make an insoluble plaque. This is a picture of one. And these plaques are floating in between the neurons, the brain cells. And unfortunately, for a neuron to communicate, it has to send a message from one neuron across a space to the next neuron to be picked up. And these get in the space and gum up the process. Okay. Now I'm going to show you a picture inside a neuron. This is a picture of tau protein. Now tau is supposed to keep a cell structured and deliver nutrients to the cell. And I usually describe it as a railroad track. You'll have to imagine I don't have two hands to use today because of the mic. So picture a railroad track. It's long and it's straight and it's got ties across it. See any resemblance to the train track there? And the answer is obviously no. What happens is the tau misprocesses and tau protein then, it, it becomes a tangle, a neurofibrillary tangle. And what that does is it slowly kills the cell. Eventually, the cell gets sick, it dies, it shrinks away. We don't see this from the outside, but this is going on. The next thing I want to show you is sort of some of the shrinkage. So on this side, on your left, you have a nice, healthy brain. It's kind of plump and kind of juicy, you know? It, it, but when you look on the other side, we've got an Alzheimer's example for you. Dan, oh, there is enough. Good. I didn't know if I could get over here. <laughs> what I wanted to draw your attention to is the gaps. Look at the gaps in the singular drive. There's huge space there. There shouldn't be. You don't want space in your brain. That is cells, MIA. Those are cells that are not there anymore. And you can lose, they call it atrophy as it, as it uh, shrinks away. You can lose up to a quarter of your brain. And that is why people don't do what they used to do the way they used to do it. Now I'm going to show you another picture here. There's, a, there's three things I want you to, to take away from this shot. Three things. These are the healthy brains, and on the far right, the brains that have dementia. What we're looking at, I'm going to put this down. What we're looking at right now is a picture as if you were looking down into the top of somebody's skull. This is the forehead, and that's the back of the brain. So the first thing, number one, I want to draw your attention to on the healthy brains. The brain basically fills the entire skull. It really comes right out. When you have dementia, look at the shrinkage. Look at how much further back the brain is in comparison. That tells you that the brain is shrinking from the outside in. Number two, I want to draw your attention <coughs> to these small black areas. These are called ventricles. 
They're filled with cerebral spinal fluid. In the, they're very small in the healthy brain. In the brain that has dementia, look how enlarged they are. Look how much space is there. That tells you the brain is shrinking from the inside out. And the third thing, the last thing, if you look at the white matter, and it is white on the slide, you can see how clear the branches are. You can see how much white matter exists. When you look here, it's sharp and it's defined. When you look on the brain of somebody living with dementia, it's very shadowy, it's faded, it's not strong anymore. I didn't do this to put you off your lunch. <laughs> I did this because I really think it's important for you to appreciate how well people living with dementia are actually doing, considering what's going on upstairs. And I think it helps us be a little more patient if we can understand what's happening or not happening as we go. This is the last one. I just want to give you a piece of advice about hearing. I, this might not be clear to you, but I, I can talk you through it. This is about understanding, and this is about hearing, and this is a healthy brain. When people develop dementia, the hearing portion of the brain doesn't get radically affected, which is good news. But the understanding portion of the brain, the comprehension piece, takes a walloping. So if we try to communicate by raising our voices because we assume somebody didn't hear us, if we raise our voices in an attempt to make ourselves understood and the person has damaged comprehension, <coughs> what they will walk out with is they were mad at me. They were angry at me. It will not make the communication better. It will actually throw it off track. This is a picture of the hippocampus. Healthy brain, not healthy brain. Your hippocampus, down in the limbic system, center of your brain, everything you see and you hear or you read has to go into the hippocampus to go to the cortex to go to long-term storage. When your hippocampus is damaged, you can't retain new information. It's like my mother calls it Teflon brain. Nothing sticks. <laughs> Nothing sticks. The tricky part is that people have many memory systems. We think, oh, we got a good memory or we don't we got bad memory. Our memory is very complicated. There are multiple layers and multiple types of memory within our memory system. Immediate memory lets us talk. Short-term memory lets us store stuff and put it into long-term memory. So you can talk to somebody with dementia, but they might not be getting it to put it in to retain it. And then the very last picture is temper and personality regions. Okay. I'm aware of the time, so I'm moving us on. Folks, this slide might be a little scary, but don't worry, and I know you can't see it well, but don't worry because I brought it written out for you to take home. When you leave today on the table outside in the hall, I will have a stack of these brochures and I brought a few extra, so if you want to take one for a neighbor, feel free. What I brought was the 10 warning signs for dementia. I know it says the 10 warning signs for Alzheimer's. I work for the Alzheimer's Society, but we really are the dementia society. There's three things I want you to know before you read the brochure. Because when you look at the warning signs, I'm willing to bet you're going to suddenly have a moment of panic. You're going to think, oh, that was me yesterday. Holy Toledo, that was me this morning. <laughs> there is a measuring stick. And this is the important part because we can all forget things. We can all lose things. Yeah. Does it interfere with your ability to function on a daily basis? Okay, that's your measuring stick. Point two, I know they have numbers on them, but they're not rank ordered. 
You don't get one, then two, then three. It doesn't work that way at all. In fact, number 10, the loss of initiative, is what usually gets people to the doctor long before memory loss does. So they're not rank ordered. The third piece, the third takeaway, is that yes, these are the warning signs for dementia. So when you take this brochure home and, and you maybe think I should follow up on this, please do. But this will also give you a pretty clear idea of what people living with dementia face on a daily basis. So it gives you a pretty good flavor of life with dementia. Okay, moving on. Getting a diagnosis. So let's say you took the brochure and one of you went, oh, phew, I'm good. And one of you went, oh, you know what? Maybe I should go to the doc. You start with your family doctor. You start with your GP. What they want to do is they want to eliminate any other possible reason that you may be confused or have memory issues or lack focus. And so they're probably gonna do a full workup. They're going to do blood tests, not to prove you have dementia, to, to prove you don't have thyroid disease or undetected diabetes or another metabolic disorder or a vitamin deficiency or a brain tumor or something else that could be a fault that's treatable. When they're looking at diagnosing, it's really a process of elimination. So they have to eliminate all other possible causes, get a baseline on how you're functioning, and then look over time. So you don't usually, unless it's more advanced, you wouldn't walk in and out with a diagnosis on the same day. It takes a while and your GP may choose to refer you on to a memory clinic or a geriatrician or a geriatric psychiatrist or a neurologist, or it depends on your symptoms. But you start with your family doc. There are a few medications in Canada. They are designed to support people living with Alzheimer's. The first three, the Aricep, Exelon, and Reminel, are designed for earlier stage, the Abixa for later stage. They don't work for everybody. They are not a silver bullet. They do not stop the disease process. They help some people with some symptoms for some of the time. There's been a lot on the news about new medications available. They're not in Canada yet. They're starting to use them in the States. But you have to be very, 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 very early in your disease process to benefit from them. Okay, so let's talk progression. I hope you can all see the screen. Okay, so we've got three uh, distinct early, middle, and late. We've got three boxes there. But behind the boxes, we've got an arrow ongoing. And really, the arrow is the story. When we're talking about dementia, we're talking about something that is very slow in its progression. It starts very insidiously. It's usually only in hindsight we can look back and see really what was going on because usually when we see those first warning signs, there's a reason. They were tired. They had the flu. They'd been away. We can excuse the red flags for a while. When we have dementia, the specialists, the scientists, and the specialists actually believe that the organic breakdown in the brain is starting about 20 years, that is two decades, before the symptoms appear. So it's very slow, it's very insidious. You start to gather symptoms. Your early stage is gonna be your longest. Then you move into middle and on towards late. It's not distinct stages. <clears throat> you look that way, but they're not. You wouldn't be in early stage on Monday and middle stage on Tuesday. It's just a more so. And as it goes, you're going to get more symptoms and the symptoms that you collect will become more intense. There is no way to say how long a dementia is going to affect somebody. It can be anywhere from two to 20 years. 
It depends on so many different factors. It depends on the type of dementia, the age the person is, the amount of support the person has, how many other comorbid, that means other disease processes they have. Maybe they have diabetes and arthritis as well. Maybe they have COPD or heart disease as well. Uh, so there are so many different factors that, that make a difference. And then it moves to, to late stage. These are actually the things that people experience. And I put this slide in not to be really complicated. We've got the A words. But I put it in because I want you to have at least once seen or heard the words that the clinicians and the doctors and the medical staff use. And then I'm going to explain what those words are. So aphasia is loss of language. Aphasia is really something that is a, a two-path situation because we get language in, receptive, and language out, expressive. When folks have dementia, those two pathways don't necessarily diminish at exactly the same rate. So you can have somebody who understands you pretty well but can't articulate, and you can have people who did not comprehend what you say, but they have relatively intact language. Yes, fine, okay, good, yeah, I'm up for that. And then you start to do it and it's like, whoa, because <laughs> they didn't get it. So just be a little cautious there. When we're talking aphasia, it's not just verbal language, it's also written and visual. Agnosia is a loss of recognition, and that's across all five of your senses. So think of us having a filing cabinet in our brain of all our experiences and knowledge. So when our senses send some message to the brain, the brain goes to the filing cabinet and looks up, what is this about and what should I do? How should I react to this? But when somebody has dementia, the key for the filing cabinet has become lost and the bottom drawer is locked tight. The middle drawer, somebody got into that middle drawer and they took half the files away. And the top drawer, oh yeah, they took the files and shredded them and then dumped them back in in a hell of a mess. Hmm. And that is what it is like for somebody living with dementia. They are always getting information, but they can't always sort it out because their filing cabinet is a mess. So they may misinterpret things, they may misunderstand things, they may misrecognize things. They might not recognize people. They might not recognize objects. Apraxia, loss of purposeful movement. I think we can do this in this room. I'm going to lean up against the wall. I'm going to invite you to put, put your right foot out and just circle your right foot around to the right if you would. Now take your left foot and circle your left foot. What happened to your right foot? went the other way. It didn't do what you asked it to do. Do whatever you want with your feet, but don't kick it. <laughs> just for the splittest second, just for a nanosecond, you experienced apraxia. You asked your body to do something and it did something else. And that's what happens when the messages can't get from the brain to the body part. We want to our brain to instigate to do something and we have the thought but the thought just won't go where it needs to go. So when people have apraxia, they usually struggle with right from left, can't tell right from left, up from down, backwards from forwards, and over and under. And we with healthy brains, we can't even imagine what that, that's like. We, we really can't understand that. So when, let's say you're dressing somebody who has apraxia and you say, could you lift your foot up? And they push their foot into the floor as hard as they can. And you think, well, that's not very cooperative. That could be the apraxia happening there. The trick is, apraxia can be situational. It can come and it can go. 
So it does make people look sometimes like they're being difficult when they're not. But there are other pieces with apraxia. Often people can't do things in the right order. So let's stick with dressing as an example. They might put on their shoes and then try to put the sock on over the shoe. Or they might put three socks on one foot and nothing on the other foot. So they don't do things in the right order and they usually struggle with manual dexterity. Buttons, hooks, zippers, clasps, things like that. Agnosia, loss of self-awareness. I think this is the trickiest one for families to wrap their heads around. It's the biggest word. You don't need to know anisognosia, but you need to know how it plays out. People are not in denial about their condition. People have lost their insight, and so they do not recognize their own deficits. It's a paradox. They forget that they forget. They don't know that they don't know. They think they're just fine. Nothing wrong with me. I'm A-OK, -okay, so I don't need your help. Toddle off, thank you. I'm doing it. I'm, I'm OK. You're, you're wrong. But if I have dementia, and I'm unaware of it, and about 50% of the people living with dementia will be totally unaware that they have it, and something goes awry, my purse goes missing. Hmm, I probably put it somewhere safe and forgot. But I don't think there's anything wrong with me. And I wouldn't be stupid enough to misplace my purse. That's not something I do in my life. So who am I going to blame? You. You in the flowered shirt. It's obviously you, because it couldn't have been me. Right? Exactly. So they point at their nearest and their dearest and they blame them, and it's not denial, it's that they cannot see that they are involved in the problem. Altered perceptions, loss of perceptual acuity, fancy words. What it means in real life is that as we age, we lose peripheral vision. We, we're probably all experiencing that. I know I am, I'm gonna take a guess that some of you might have noticed you have a little less peripheral vision than you used to, but Okay, we're gonna do a little experiment here. So, people living with dementia, they start to lose peripheral vision. Then it goes to scuba vision. So give yourself scuba vision for just a minute. When you've got scuba vision, can you see the person sitting beside you without turning your head? Yes. No. Yes. You're lucky then. If you can see, yeah, but they're not directly beside you, they're in front of you. Now, I want you to take your hands and go binocular vision because that's the next phase. Can you see without looking down? Can you see your plate and your napkin and your cutlery without looking down for it? No. And at the end, it's going to be monocular vision, one eye. That means your depth perception is gone. So what happens? We ask people to multitask, but they can't. They can't be social and talk across the table and see their plate and eat their food at the same time. I can do one or I can do the other, but it's very challenging for people. And we expect them to navigate the environment as if they had a full range of vision. And we say, oh, they're being clumsy. They often have lost that there's a chair down there or where the edge of the doorway is. That's visual change. Now, when I took you through that and it got worse and worse, when it gets to the point where they lose their depth perception, you're going to have trouble with stairs. You're actually going to have trouble, trouble watching TV. It suddenly becomes two-dimensional instead of three-dimensional. And people can actually get really scared that what they see on the television is happening in the room with them. So seriously, be cautious about news, um, cop shows, things like that. They lose depth perception, which means if they were going to go from this light flooring in this room 
out to the darker flooring in the foyer, if they have really damaged depth perception, it won't look like it's on the level, even though it is. It will look like the darker is down and they'll be trying to step down a bit as they exit the room. You'll notice they, they might walk around a black mat because it looks like a hole. Sometimes they won't step into a, a bathtub because they can't see where the bottom is. Clear water in a white bathtub, no depth perception, no bottom. People living with dementia are never stupid. Never, ever, ever are they stupid. They are self-protective. So if I have lost my depth perception and you're asking me to do something that seems dangerous to me, I'm going to put you off. And because I've lost my filters, I'm probably going to put you off any way I know how. <laughs> Amnesia, loss of uh, memory. I don't think that one needs much explaining. But I do want to talk about saying that people are living in the past. They're not living in the past. They live here and now in 2023, but they only have access to past information. And that makes it really, really hard for them to function. I'm gonna go back and say one more thing about altered perception. I wanna talk about color acuity for a minute. If you have damaged color, all that means is, unless things are high contrast, you can't see them. You lose the ability to distinguish the difference between brown and, and blue and black. They all look the same. You can't tell the difference between gray and lavender and certain shades of blue. So unless something is high contrast, let's say black on yellow or black and white, it might be hard to pick up red on purple. Nothing there. Just fades into itself. So make sure things are good high contrast for folks. I'll go back to amnesia for a minute. When you're having conversation, usually what is intact for people are the memories laid down in their youth, somewhere from about age 10 up to their very early adulthood, about age 25. Those memories tend to remain the longest. They are ingrained for multiple reasons. They often contain your first, your first kiss, your first car, your first job, your first marriage, your first house, your first baby. Those are stories that are rehearsed, they're encoded because they've been gone over and over, and they have an emotional component to it. And that's, that's why they're ingrained the longest. So often that's a rich, area of conversation for somebody. And then this apathy, loss of initiative. I told you that's often the first thing that gets somebody to the dock because people, it looks like they are disinterested. It looks like they have lost interest. It's a little switch that gets turned off in your head. When you have dementia and you have apathy, you literally do not think to engage. So you do not think to initiate conversation, action. Often you don't see the need to do things. I don't need to change my clothes. You might have worn the same outfit for 10 days. Two, three days I buy. 10 days, you might have had a spill or two by now. But you don't see the need. And you don't see why you should be told to change your clothes. You don't see the reasoning with it, and that's why that gets you to the dock first thing. Looking at the time. Oh, no. So that's the medical stuff. We're done with the medical stuff. If you're going to write anything down, I see a few of you taking notes. This is the sentence that you want to write down. And if you're not taking notes, repeat it to yourself in your head. Dementia is a shift in the way a person experiences the world around them, because that sums it up. And if that is our guiding understanding, you don't need the medical understanding. I gave it to you for interest sake, but this is what you need. You need to take to heart, dementia is a shift in the way a person experiences the world around them. So what does that mean for us? 
Well, I said earlier, the questions were going to be tough to answer because everybody is unique. Everybody's situation is individual. Everybody's journey is different. I told you I have some relatives, with, I have more than one, I have several relatives with dementia. But you wouldn't know their journeys are so divergent, so different, even though they all have dementia. You can have two people with the same type of dementia and they still have very divergent journeys. Processing speed is slow. So, people living with dementia often start to withdraw because they can't keep up with conversation. And that is just about the worst possible thing they can do because one of the most positive things to help people with dementia stay healthy and function longer is to have social interaction. So this is where we need to slow ourselves down. We gotta wait for them. We cannot drag them to our speed. The whole situation for people living with dementia, it's as if people who are healthy are buzzing about like flies, too fast to keep up with, too fast to trace, too fast to follow. And so when we take somebody living with dementia somewhere where they can easily be overwhelmed by the environment, somewhere very noisy or very busy or very rushed, we're probably asking for an upset. This, this is a, a blessing in many ways. People lose memory for sure and they lose ability for sure but they retain the ability to feel their own emotions. They might not be empathetic the way they were in the past, but they will feel their own feelings. And so what that means is you might be talking to somebody and suddenly they're in tears or they're angry or they're laughing wildly. And you think, where'd that come from? That's out of the blue. You and I, that might be bubbling up in us, but we can check it, and we might check it without even thinking about it. It's as if the filters are gone for the person. So the ability to control emotion becomes damaged, not the ability to feel. And that's why it's so important, if we want to give good care, in my opinion, good dementia care equals emotional comfort. People are comfortable emotionally, they won't give you a lot of pushback. People go on believing what their brain is telling them. We all trust our brains. Our brains are telling us right now that you're sitting down, that you're in the church, that lunch is coming. Why would you disbelieve your brain? You've been relying on your brain ever since you were a young child. And so they never lose that habit and people never lose their adult sensibilities. They go on believing what the brain is telling them, even though it might be misinterpreting the environment or the situation. But they're gonna believe their brain first. <coughs> Whoopsie. So when it comes to communication, yep, I'm afraid it's our responsibility to really make it happen. You need to be aware of your expectations and go in with, with realistic expectations. And since you know your family member or friend best, you have the best chance of communicating. You know their past, their history, their likes, their dislikes, their stories. They get stuck, you can fill in the blank. So here are some ideas. I'm gonna give you a bunch of ideas, but I want you to see the chart. How depressing, I'm standing here blathering on at you. Words, words only account for 7% of our communication. That's not very much. So bear in mind that it is your tone of voice and your nonverbal, your body talk, your actions. That is what people are gonna read. And as language becomes damaged, as they lose their nouns and their pronouns and their ability to follow conversation, they are going to follow your nonverbal, your emotion, your message. And what they're going to do is they're going to retain the ability for the rhythm of speech 
So they often recognize if you've asked a question or not. They might not get the question, but they'll know it's a question and they'll say something because they know it's their turn to speak. But they really rely on the nonverbal. So I'm trying my best to smile at you through the mask today. <laughs> I have to wear the mask. But um, you might have a harder time getting it. When you're talking to somebody living with dementia, it might feel uncomfortable, but I'm gonna suggest that you really work on exaggerating your facial expressions. Make sure they come through. So here are some strategies. Show and talk. If you want somebody to do something, like maybe have a drink, mimic the drink or pick up a drink yourself. With my people, when I walk in the door at the end, and I go right from work to the house, um, I walk in the door, the first thing I do is I make two glasses of water. One for them and one for me. They have a different glass so they can tell the glasses apart. Otherwise, they can't tell which glass they're supposed to be drinking. I have learned this the hard way. They don't know which glass to be drinking out of. So I have a tall glass, they have a short glass. Holds the same amount, but it's different visually. But how do I get them to drink? When I drink, they drink. If I say have a drink, nothing happens. So always the show, show and talk. Reduce distractions. People living with dementia lose the ability to tune out what they do not need to attend to. If there's um, uh, stuff going on in the kitchen and there was rattling and banging, you would know, I don't have to go in the kitchen and deal with that. I'm gonna stay and listen to, I hope you would stay and listen to the speaker. But somebody living with dementia, any noise, any action, anything that happens, it's a new distraction and they're often following it. So don't try to talk over the television, the radio, action. They're watching something out the window. Give up until you have their full attention. You will communicate better if you have A, their attention, and B, they are alert. Don't talk to them when they're falling asleep. I see people do that, and I think to myself, why, why are you doing this? I need to be calm when people do that. We all need to be calm when we're talking to folks with dementia. Unless the house is on fire and there's a certain amount of urgency to move somebody out of the way of danger, if you stay calm, they tend to stay calm. If I were, now I'm standing up and you're sitting down, but normally when I converse with somebody, whatever eye level they're at, I try to make sure I'm at the same eye level. I never go over and talk over somebody or stand beside somebody to talk to them because the power differential is all they're gonna pick up on that, nonverbal. So you wanna be at their level. It's adult to adult, that's all you're doing. You're keeping it adult to adult. Because language takes such a hit, often they use rhyming words or they use um, sort of garbled words where they join two together, or they use words in the same ballpark. They want the salt and they ask for the sugar. Or they're talking about the cat, there's the cat lady, they're talking about the cat, but really they're, they're talking about their hat. So you always have to be listening to what it might mean. This is a big one. One of the things that I really applaud people for is trying to bring autonomy into the lives of people living with dementia. But if we try to give them too much choice, it actually backfires, it overwhelms and shuts them down. So an open-ended question is one where you ask them what they want. What do you want to drink? What do you want to eat? Where do you want to go? What do you want to watch on TV? Any what question, any open-ended question is a problem because you have to know all the possible choices you have to then gather them and remember them long enough to rank, order them, and then come up with an answer. And people living with dementia can't do that. So often they go to, I don't care, or I don't know. If you truly want to give somebody choice, give them two choices. Would you like chicken or fish? Would you like to watch Shirley Valentine or what's another movie? Sorry, I just showed that to my mom. That's why it's on my brain. Um, or the thin man. You know, give them a choice. When people get past making a choice, 
Think of it as a funnel. Get away from the open-ended, go down to choice questions, and then go down to the base of the funnel where it's strictly a yes or no. So you might say, do you want coffee? And it gets to yes or no. And then you might also have to show them. Show them a cup of coffee if you want coffee. Logic or reasoning? Don't go there. You're not going to win the argument. You're going to frustrate yourself. You're going to upset them. They're not going to remember all the logic and all the good reasons you gave them for something, but they're going to remember the emotion of the conversation. That is all they will retain at the end of the day. So don't fight with them. They believe what they believe. And if you fight with them, you rock their world and not in a good way. You always want to be working on relationship. What is most important is relationship. And please don't talk about the person as if they're not present. Don't walk up to a couple where one has dementia and the other doesn't and say to the spouse, well, how are they doing? I know, it boggles my mind. Don't do it. Make sure your verbal and nonverbal messages match. And this is huge because we can say the right words, but if we don't say it with sincerity and in the right way, they ain't buying what we're selling. It is not going to happen. So always make sure your verbal and nonverbal match. I want to look a little bit about strengths. These are remaining strengths. So emotional awareness and emotional memory remain. Usually, primary motor abilities will remain for a fair amount of time. The ability to use their senses to enjoy, I, I take things that smell nice. I take lily of the valley in the spring, and I take cinnamon rolls, and I take things with good scent, or, or um, I, gave, I got some really lovely uh, hand soap at Christmas that was all nutmeggy and you know, smelled good. So anything that appeals to the senses. Long-term memory tends to be intact, so go back there. If, though, they're making mistakes, as you see it, in the stories they tell, please don't argue with them. Just go with the flow. You are there to join their journey. You're not there to correct. You're not the truth police. So, you know, unless... We have a rule at our house. We do not argue unless it is immoral, illegal, or dangerous. Other than that, we go with the story of the day. Who cares whether they had red lights or blue lights on the Christmas tree 80 years ago? Does, seriously, in the grand scheme of things. And yet I have seen people go, no, no, it was red. I'm trying to keep them under the table. No, let it go. Music. I was so pleased to sing, and I knew one of the hymns. I picked up on the other two. But... Um, when it comes to music, music resides in a different place than language. So music will probably be available to the person throughout their entire journey, even after they stop speaking. Music is still available. And uh, if they ever had a sense of humor, they will probably retain their sense of humor. But it will change a little bit. Because when they lose language, they won't get puns, they won't get sarcasm, they won't get word jokes, but they will get the broad broad humor and they, they will get smiles and, and laughter. So a quick word on meaningful activities. If you're going to do something with somebody, truly it is the journey, not the destination. It is the doing. Who cares if the product turns out? Never, never think this has to work. Always think this is an opportunity to interact. <laughs> This is a chance for time together. How can I make it the best quality time? If somebody's playing dominoes with you and they stop playing dominoes and they start building things, then build things, right? Just go with, who cares about the rules? Let it go. Building strategies. I'm gonna talk a bit about brain health and I brought you everything you need to know written out. Yay, brochure. Heads up for healthier brains in the foyer. You'll be able to get that on the way out. And if you can combine things, this is just ideas. If you do things in a social setting, so good for you, come to every one of those things that was advertised. You know, join up to the groups, come to your Christmas dinner, do all those things. Be social, it's incredibly good for your brain. 
Okay, so here are some ideas for you. You want to be physical. I know you've heard it before and you're going to hear it again, but that's because it's true. You want to be physically active every day. You want to protect your head from falls. I'm going to make sure there are no cords here when you come up to talk. Um, you want to challenge your brain. Just like we challenge ourselves for exercise, it's got to be slightly out of our comfort zone. Something new and different. Those are the watchwords, new and different socially active, and definitely heart smart in your diet. Now when you look at this list up here, there's nothing on that list that you wouldn't want for yourself. Well, you know what? It's exactly the same for people who have a diagnosis, except they need a few extra things. They need this list with an adapted environment, enhanced communication techniques, and educated caregivers. So thank you for coming out and hearing what I had to say today. The person cannot help their behavior. It is caused by an organic brain disease. So we, we have to change our behavior, ourselves. These are just some of the opportunities for support that you can receive at the Alzheimer's Society, Waterloo Wellington. They are available to you by phoning us or emailing us. We have, um, I didn't even get a chance to touch on people becoming lost. That's a whole nother talk if you ever have me back again. But seriously, six out of 10 people living with dementia will have a missing incident. And it is a huge concern. It's a talk unto itself. But if you need some information, there is the, the info. And then I know that you were asking different ways that people could support you and different ways that people can support the society is, is through donations. I accept prayers personally, but we really need some cash dollars <laughs> at the society. So if you're ever in a position that you gave to us, thank you. And if you ever could in the future, thank you in advance. So that's our contact information. What I can do is if you are interested in the slides, I can send a copy to Eric here and make sure that he can fly them out to you or share them in some way. And now I'm going to address the questions. Okay, why do patients, I'm gonna just skip to I think the most important. Why do patients fight you on washing clothes and bed sheets and taking showers and baths? It's a combination of things. I could honestly believe I don't need to do it. I could honestly believe because my brain is telling me I'm okay and my memory is damaged that I think I did it. I could not understand what you wanted from me and even if I understood it, I didn't know how to do it. I can no longer tell the difference between the bottles and the shower, which way to turn the taps. I don't want to get undressed, I'm cold. Why would I get undressed? It's freezing in here. All reasons that make sense to the person in the moment because they're not looking at the world the same way you are looking at the world. So maybe it's not, yeah, smell bad, because who wants to hear <laughs> an insult? Seriously, it could be the truth, but that is not going to get the person into the shower. You know what? So and so is coming over. Why don't we both get fresh enough? Tell you what? I got some new clothes. If there's a reason that makes sense to them, you've got a better chance. Mm -hmm. If they are, uh, if it's physically difficult, depending on how your home is configured, can do they have to step over the edge of the bathtub? Do you have? good proper grab bars do you have a seat in the shower the other thing is because of the change in senses all that water if you're showering coming down on their heads boy is that usually not a good experience for people and what do we do we start by washing people top down that's the logical way to go about it but it's not the dementia friendly way to go about it and we expect them to take off all their clothes. Yeah. So who cares if they bathe in their underwear? Hopefully you have more than two pairs in the house. Give them a third pair to put on and wash the wet one and the dirty one. But whatever you have to do to maintain their dignity and to make them feel comfortable. 
Um, why do patients have days of clarity and others of oh yeah. Lord, I'd give ten dollars to know the answer to this one. I cannot tell you why sometimes the brain cells fire and sometimes they don't. I really can't. There are sudden moments of clarity. It's almost like a really cloudy day and then all of a sudden there's a shaft of sunlight and then the clouds come in again. And you think, oh, they can do it if they want. No, they can't. Mm -hmm. Or you think, oh, the dog got it wrong. No, the dog didn't get it wrong. It depends on so many things. Are they feeling comfortable? Have they had a good night's sleep? Are they in pain or not in pain? And they often can't articulate that for you. Do they, uh, you know, uh, I can't answer that. There's no answer. I see it in my life. What you will know, though, is that people tend to have good days and bad days, and they tend to have good times of day and less good times of day. You will, you will notice patterns like that. Yeah, why are people so routine? Well, we actually recommend routine. We call routine the GPS of dementia. Routine feels safe and secure. It might bore the rest of us to tears, but routine allows somebody with damaged memory cells to actually function. I have such a great story about this. Go ahead, yeah, go ahead. I'm not going to tell it's you. It's okay. Yeah, we're, yeah. we're not going to starve. Look at us. Okay. <laughs> Speak for yourself. The, uh, forgive me, Pastor. The thing that happened to me, this is a long time ago, and my, my dad ran a company, and he had a, an employee in the company, and the employee had a father who lived in Newfoundland, and the employee wanted his dad to come and visit him in Ontario. Dad lives alone in Newfoundland. So the employee arranged with some neighbors and his dad to get his dad to the airport, get him on a plane, and the employee would pick him up in Toronto. And I get this frantic call from my father's office and the employee is sitting next to my dad. And my dad calls me and says, I think we need to talk. Brian's here with me. I'm gonna put Brian on the line. And Brian said to me, I didn't know flying could give somebody Alzheimer's. Okay, I better pick this one apart. <laughs> Flying did not give his dad Alzheimer's disease. His dad, out there in Newfoundland, living alone in his own little house with his own little routine, was just hanging on. Dad had dementia, but dad had his strict routine, and he just followed his routine, and he was managing. And they took dad away, they made him extra tired because he was at the airport for hours. Then he was on a plane. It's new. It's different. I don't understand it. They put him in Toronto Airport. Now that would give anybody a headache. <laughs> and then they bring him home and they can't understand why he's a lost puppy. But he's a lost puppy because he wasn't in his routine. And we have noticed this. We have bent over backwards to maintain routine for our relatives because it truly makes a difference. And people say, well, I came for a visit and they were having such a good time, I decided to stay two hours longer. Hmm. Well, thanks for coming for a visit. But what happened by them staying two hours longer is that the exhaustion factor for the person was actually so high they couldn't even eat. They just had to go lie down. They were just they were just shaking and gibbering when the person left. And the person said, we had such a good time. It was wonderful. I'm going to do that again. No, you're not. <laughs> no, no. You're welcome to come. But I'm going to tell you why they need to let them stick to their routine. So routines really are important. You and I can maybe pivot on a dime, but people with dementia cannot change their train of thought so quickly. They cannot, um, they cannot understand because they don't have the same ability to understand the consequences of actions. So uh, when, when they are in their comfort zone, they usually function really well. Uh, why do they remember some families and not family members and not other family members? 
I can't answer that. It can tie into the anosognosia, the loss of recognition. It can tie into the amnesia. It can tie into the number of times they see somebody or interact with somebody. There's no easy or, or one single answer. And why don't they show emotion? I, okay, last story about emotion. The, the ability to, they will retain the ability to feel their own feelings, but they will lose sometimes empathy and they will lose the, they get what we call a, a mask or a Parkinsonian face. They get a very flat affect where they can't show emotion on their face. And I, I see this all the time. And so I'm gonna tell you about an experiment. Uh, the researchers were working with people with advanced Alzheimer's. These people were mute, and these people had totally flat affect, no facial expression. And they had their family's permission and they didn't do anything bad or harmful to them. What they did is they hooked them up to biometric feedback machines. So non-invasive, easy peasy, they showed these people pictures of their families and they showed them pictures of strangers. And the biofeedback machines lit up for the families and did not light up for the strangers. But there was no change on their face. You couldn't tell from the outside. Um, so I really encourage you never assume nobody's home. Never assume the lights are completely out. You don't know. You don't want to say anything in front of them that you wouldn't have said face to face, looking in the eye when they were perfectly well. And you don't want to talk about them to other people in, in front of them because you never know what they are taking in. And I know I'm over time, but thank you. Thank you so much.